Welcome, one and all. It just turned four o'clock. My name is Scott Lang, and I'm here with Andrew, my colleague, who won't let me say his last name, uh, for our latest webinar in the COVID webinar series, Understanding ESSER, a once-in-a-generation opportunity. We couldn't be more happy that you are here today. We couldn't be more excited. I even put on, Andrew, you like my tie? I, I put on a tie for this webinar. Are you impressed? It looks good. Thank you. I pre are you wearing a tie, Andrew? I certainly am not. <laughs> you know, one of the reasons I literally, I, I put on a tie today, I've been, I've probably done 30 webinars in the past uh, 35 weeks. And I literally thought, this is different. Today is different. Today is special. Today is new. Today is the day where there's enough vaccine for everyone. Today is the day we're starting to give teenagers vaccines. Today is the day that spring is beginning. Spring training is starting. And today's the day we look forward not look back. I am done looking back. I haven't put on a tie in so long I can't remember. And I just wanted to, to make this day special, not just for you, but for me, because today is special. Now, whether you're joining us in real time uh, on, on, uh, on the Zoom call or whether you're with us on Facebook Live, unfortunately, we couldn't house everyone in the actual Zoom room. The responses were all off the charts and we just don't have the zoom capacity for that so if you're joining us on facebook live welcome there um we're glad that you're joining us and if you're joining us in real time in the zoom take this moment introduce yourself tell us where you're from tell us one thing about your program tell us one thing that you feel hopeful for that's what i want in the chat box not doom not gloom not what's wrong let's put your name where you're from and one thing that you're hopeful for inside that chat box that would be great now the reason i say today's the day is because for every day that you spent staring into a computer screen this is the day for every day you thought i can't do this anymore this is the day. For every day you questioned whether you even wanted to be a teacher anymore, this is the day. You know, it's an interesting thing because, and if you've been on one of my webinars before, or one of the webinars I talked about this, the Chinese character for crisis is really two characters and they don't look like yous at all. I don't know why I'm making that sound, but that's what the Chinese character for crisis is. It's two characters and one represents danger and one represents opportunity. And for all of you that have spent time with me and I've shared that with you, I've talked about what the opportunities that COVID brought about, whether it's a reset in your life, whether it's a reset in your classroom, whether it's a chance to view everything from a wide angle lens, whether you chose for the reset button to be hit, the reset button was hit. The danger was real. The danger was present. The danger was scary and still is, but it's the opportunity. One of the things I've been sharing with people is that you can't have one without the other. And they're perfectly in synchronous and in harmony towards it. It's a yin and a yang. And by that, I mean, the greater the danger, the greater the opportunity. You can't have little danger, inc incredible opportunity. You can't have incredible danger and little opportunity. And that the danger has been so omnipresent and so significant, but that means the opportunity has been so omnipresent and so significant. The, in the opportunity to impact students in a way that we never would have. The opportunity to think about our profession in a way that we never would have. The opportunity to rethink about how we teach and why we teach in a way that we never would have. And the opportunity for ESSER, which is something that we would have never had if it weren't for this moment. And this ESSER bill is something that's so profound and so significant, it could have a lasting impact on you and your program. Now, understand this. Today's, uh, today's webinar is going to be broken up into two parts. Part one is understanding ESSER. And I'm just going to walk you through the salient points of the bill, the things that you need to know in order to be successful. That's not really the important part because anybody with a fourth grade education can read the bill and figure this out. You don't need me to do that. After all, I'm a drummer. You don't want me doing that. But what I am is a band director. What I am is an administrator. What I am is someone who thinks on a wide angle lens. And that's the back half of the webinar. It's a chance to look at the bill and lay it over a music program and see how it really operates. Because that's always been our goal at Be Part of the Music, real solutions to real problems in real time. And that's what this is about. Now, before we start into the presentation, I need you to take that today's the day mentality. Say it to yourself. Today is the day, because you gotta remember one thing. I don't believe there's another program. I don't believe there's another group of kids. I don't believe there's another teacher who's been more impacted by COVID than music teachers. I don't believe it. 
And it, it isn't a badge of honor that I wear willingly. It isn't a badge of honor that I carry around and gloat about. It isn't something that I have pride in. I hate what it's done to us. But the bottom line is I really genuinely, honestly believe with every fiber of my being that no program, no group of students, and no teacher has been more impacted by COVID than you. And if you've been impacted the most, then get behind this mindset. You deserve the most. If your program has been the most impacted, if your students have been the most impacted, then they are the most deserving of this opportunity. So get on your big boy or big girl pants, put on the Superman badge and get ready to fight because you have earned this. For every day you sat in front of a computer, you earned this opportunity. For every day that you sat wondering, what am I gonna teach tomorrow? That you earned this opportunity. For every day you thought, I can't do this anymore. You earned this opportunity. You earned this. That was the danger. This is the opportunity. And danger without opportunity is just a waste. It's just a waste. Nobody has been impacted more than your students. So nobody is more deserving than your students. So I'm going to start the presentation now. And during this presentation, Andrew's going to be manning the chat box. So if you have any questions or anything comes up, he's the guy that you're going to want to talk to. And he's going to take good care of you. So Andrew, I'm going to ask, can you see my screen right now? Yep, I can. All right. So here we go. It's off to the races, understanding Esther. Now, if we're going to understand Esther, let's start with a warning. I am not a subject matter expert. I am not a policy wonk. I'm not someone who spent 15 years in Washington. I'm a drummer. I can barely read. I scratch and sniff. Everything that I'm about to share with you is not really about Esser. It's completely readable and understandable. What I am going to do with you is I'm going to take my experience as a teacher I'm going to take my experience as an administrator and I'm going to lay it over the program so that we can implement it in real time for your orchestra, in real time for your choir, in real time for your band. That's what we're here to do. Now, please understand, just because I'm not a subject matter expert doesn't mean that I can't teach it. I wasn't a subject matter expert on oboe, but I taught that. I wasn't a subject matter expert on bass trombone, but I taught that. I wasn't a subject matter on, I wasn't anything on guitar, but I taught that for three years. What we're here to do is think like a teacher and teach ourselves how to use ESSER in a meaningful way. So what is ESSER? Well, there it is. I'm not someone who likes to read to people, so I'm not going to. ESSER is simply stated, it's a part of the Corona Aid Virus uh, Repair Economic Securities Act. That's what it was created for. And ESSER really has occurred in three different levels. It occurred first in, in March, it occurred with ESSER two in late April, early May, in December, and then ESSER three, um, which passed with uh, President Joe Biden's signature just several weeks ago. So understanding that, what makes this one different, why I didn't do a webinar in, in February, why I didn't do a webinar in December is the scope and size of this most recent package is unprecedented and will likely never be repeated in my lifetime. The sheer magnitude of what this latest bill offers and the way it's structured makes it so wholly unique that it demands and commands our attention. So how is this one different? Well, you got to look at it since the pandemic began. In 2020, um, President Donald Trump signed the CARES One Relief Bill, and that was in March. As a part of that early initial bailout program, there was $13.5 billion, billion dollars. Now think about this, when we're talking about, well, it's a trillion dollar bill. I mean, 13 billion is not a small amount of that. It, it's, it's not small at all. It's a significant amount of money invested in just education. That wasn't un unemployment. That wasn't aid to the homeless. That wasn't aid to the sick. That wasn't buying more virus. I mean, more, um, more vaccine. It wasn't more research. That was just to education. But that looks small compared to what we did in December. We added $53 billion more to the coronavirus educational uh, heirs program. So now we're at close to $65 million. Now understand that. If you're talking about a, a, a $3 trillion package, a $3 trillion bailout in the scope and the sequence, what you're talking about here is literally not a small amount. It's close to 4% of the spend was just on education. $13.5 billion, $53.5 billion. You can see why I get excited, but I get more excited when you look at that. This latest bill takes the two previous bills and doubles them. 
That's $126.5 billion. That's not, please understand not every state is populated the same. That is literally $2.3 billion per state for education alone. $2.3 billion for state. And the current bill more than doubles the two previous bills together. When I saw that, that's when I was like, I've, I've got to start understanding this. There's too much money at play here. There's too much at stake here that we need things to help bring our programs back to life. And we have endured more than other programs. So we are deserving more than other programs. So I started diving in and it only got more exciting. So let me explain the structure of the bill to you. Basically, it is a very loosely structured bill in that it allows for a great deal of freedom for the LEAs, local education associations, um, to make the decisions on how that money is spent. But the way it's generally structured is it's based on Title I funding. So the less money your students have, the more money your school gets. The more money your students have, the less money your, your school gets. It's pretty much that simple. Districts have to repeat, are required, and districts are the LEAs, to spend 20% of whatever they get on learning recovery. That is significant because learning recovery is a significant part of what we do. And that the state organization is only allowed to withhold 12%, which means 88% of this has to trickle down to the local school district. Now, why is that important? because that's who's making the decision. I can't control what my governor thinks. I can't control what my state board of education thinks. I can't control what the state education association thinks. I can't really even control what my superintendent or government board thinks, but understand this, that literally 88% has to trickle down to the schools and the local school district. It can't be withheld at the state. It can't be withheld by some federal program. It has to go to you. 88%. Now, a small portion the governors can give to private schools, and there's a significant chunk of money uh, for folks who are struggling with disabilities and support for the homeless people. But that is the basic structure, that of the $126 billion, $126 billion, roughly $104 billion of it, $107 billion of it has to go to the local schools, has to. And 20% of that has to go to learning recovery. So I want to give you some context. So if you go to the state uh, department of education, not state, the national department of education, you can actually pull up your local school district. This is my local school district right here. I live in the Chandler Unified School District. It's the fourth, fifth one down. I'm surrounded by Mesa and Gilbert. So that is my area. You can actually see the money. Now it's estimated at this point. It's estimated, but you can actually see the money that's supposed to be there. So looking left to right, it looks at the average district enrollment. So looking at, um, let's say Mesa, 84,889 students, and then Tucson and Deer Valley, Chandler and Gilbert. The ESSER estimate is what they estimate at this point that those districts will get based on their Title I funding. So if you look at um, the Mesa Unified School District, it's, um, it's $183 million, $183,354,829, working out to be $2,160 a student. Now, why that matters is if you slide down to Chandler, Chandler is 35 million, which is no small amount, 323,110, it's $744 per student because Mesa has a much more significant population that, that go to Title I schools. Now, again, to give you some, co some context, to give you some context, $2,160 is what Mesa students are getting. The state of Arizona funds school as, as per, per pupil education, the PPE per pupil estimate um, is, is funded at $7,483, which is a pitiful amount worth 49 out of 50 states. But the reason I point that out is that $2,160, that's an additional 32% to their annual budget. Can you imagine if you got a 32% pay raise? Can you imagine if your household budget increased by 32%? Can you imagine if your group increased by 32% overnight? That's kind of impact. But even if you go down to my son's school, which is um, in the Chandler Unified District, he's got 4,000 kids, okay? 4,000 kids, that means it, it's $280,000 to my son's high school. My son's elementary school, my son's elementary school is 1,000 kids. That's 
thousand dollars to a single elementary school. Think about that. It's staggering the amount of money that's coming in through the ESSER program. So what makes this program different? 88% has to go to the local schools. So you don't have to deal with federal bureaucracy. You don't have to deal with, with your state board of education. It's going to come through your superintendent and your local school district. And understanding that, that many of these schools don't even know how they're going to make the decision. They haven't even gotten through that process yet because the money is just now coming in. 88%. Number two, 20% has to go to remediation. And number three is that the local schools make the decision. The local schools get the money. So when you're talking about this significant portion of, of funds, and you're talking about that the decision is going to be made by people you meet and talk to every day, people that are on your campus, people that are at your district office, people that hired you, you understand how accessible this is and the impact that it can have on your program. So what can ESSER funds be used for? It's real simple. They've narrowed it down to a 12, I think it's two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 categories that you can use it. Planning for school closure, resources to address coronavirus, improve preparedness, learning loss, training staff, purchasing hardware and software for distant learning, mental health, SEL, after school, summer school learning programs, and addressing learning loss and repairing school facilities. It's just that simple. So when you take that and you apply the lens of music, well, that wasn't supposed to happen. That was supposed to happen. These are the areas that are applicable to music education. Now, even the bottom one I grayed out, repairing school facilities, especially ventilation systems, it completely applies to your band room, but it's not likely a request that you're going to make. It's something that's going to come from your district facilities person or from your school facilities person. But if you look at of the 12 things that we literally apply, we are applicable for eight of them in some way, shape, or form, one part or another of your program is applicable for eight of the 12 criterion for you for addressing the ESSER funds. Now, when you're looking at, should I apply? What should I get? What is appropriate? You obviously wanna be as incredibly professional as possible. And you wanna be respectful of the other needs of your school community and the other needs of the students that they serve. But these are the five questions according to the Department of Education website that you should be asking yourself. Number one is, am what I'm asking for gonna prevent or prepare or respond to COVID? Number two, is it allowable under the CARES Act? And there's a list that you can read. Number three, is it reasonable and necessary? And that I think is, I love that they put that in there. Is it reasonable and is it necessary? Number four is, does it promote equity? And when they're talking about equity, everything I've read is they're talking about um, uh, equity of economics, equity of funds, and that our kids, is access to music being impeded because of access to funds? And if so, this promotes equity. So whether it's an orchestra fee or a band fee or access to an instrument or the ability to buy a shirt and tie for a concert, that promotes equity. It, you'll see that equity, whether it's through Title I funding or access to homeless uh, funds for homeless kids, they're very focused on making sure that everyone has access to a good education. And then last but not least, does it report, uh, does it support a student's return to the classroom? So you don't, the, the beauty is you don't have to meet all five of these. You don't have to meet four of these. You don't have to meet three of these. You have to meet one. If your request qualifies under any one of those 12 criteria, and you can answer yes to any one of these five questions, you are, ex you are wholly right to request funds for your students. Remember, you are fighting for your students. You are fighting for your program because we know that kids need music more than ever right now. And having access to music matters more than ever right now. And that's the heart and soul of this bill. That is the heart and soul of what it, what it wants to achieve. And I believe music not only was more impacted, is more uniquely able to address these things than almost any other curricula. So Andrew, before I show them the resource, has any 
Um, has any questions come up in the chat box that need to be asked before I move on to the resource? Uh, yes, there was a, a question here that I think you could address uh, okay. to everyone. And um, the question is, I'm at a public charter school and we were recently designated Title I. Is this available, available for charter schools? It is 100% available for charter schools from everything I've read. Um, there are no limitations on charter schools. There are even funds set aside for private schools, but they're allocated to the governor and the governor disperses them. Now the governor in Arizona has not stated that I'm aware of how he will disperse them. But the, the way I read the CARES Act and I read that provision is that it is completely accessible to charter schools in the same way that it's accessible to public schools. Were there any other questions before I move on to the next portion? Uh, there, there's a question here, Scott. If my school is not a Title I school, does that disqualify us? It absolutely does not. It's just a sliding scale of how much money you'll get. In the Chandler district, um, there are very few Title I schools. There are few, but there are very few. So they got $744. Almost all of the Mesa schools are Title I schools, almost every single one. They got $2,147 per child. Every school gets something. It's a question of whether your district has more or less Title I schools as defined by the Title I Act law. Awesome. Um, someone else is asking, um, where can they find the breakdown of the different ESSER levels like you're describing, that chart you shared? Uh, we should have coordinated. I should have got that link from you. Uh, maybe we can, uh, we'll send that out for sure tomorrow you can with the recording. Google it and it will take you to the um, State Department of Education website. And it's all really, it's honestly, it's very accessible and very readable. It's for the first time ever going to the government website. It's actually kind of interesting. So, but if you can't find it, we'll ac absolutely uh, provide that for you. Awesome. I know you're you're anxious to move to the next spot. I, I will say this real quick. Uh, Lance Nielsen chimed in and said that uh, Lance just got approved today for 500 beginning band mouthpiece kits using ESSER money. So there you go. There's a perfect example of that ESSER money being put to use. Yeah. If you're using it right now, sh don't be stingy. Share it with us and tell us how you did it. And Lance, maybe what we're about to share will be of value to you. So I'm going to share what's next. So I'm going to ask you, Andrew, can you see my screen right now? I can, yep. Okay, so if you've been with us for either the recruitment road back, roadmap, which has over 2,100 folks using our recruitment roadmap to grow music education, or you're using our musical gateway, Start a Child, Change a Life program, the COVID impact report um, is not something that is new to you. It's, um, it's something that is a part of both of those programs. Now, I gotta tell you, when we developed the COVID impact report, I. I knew we should gather this data, but I didn't know why. I just knew it would matter down the road that we would be able to measure the impact. But now this impact report has real value because it basically sets the stage for everything that you're gonna ask for. So what we did is anything that's in a box of green, you're going to fill in and you're gonna get access to this Google doc. Anything that you fill in, and once you fill in a number, it turns white. So you know that you've done it. So what we did is we, we measured the impact of the coronavirus on your enrollment. We measured the, in, the impact on your rehearsal hours. By the way, remember what I said, instructional recovery. That was huge in the, in the AIRS bill. Instructional recovery. When you can document what was lost, you can then document what to ask for. Performance opportunities. Financial impact. Again, an opportunity we're talking about equity leadership experiences, parental involvement, community service, and our opportunities. When you put your numbers in, and by the way, filling out this will take you less than two and a half minutes. You will have some groundbreaking data from with which to have a guess as to what do I need to ask for? So if I go in here and I said number, uh, number of rehearsal minutes a week, I averaged about 440 rehearsal minutes a week. In COVID, I'm guessing that went down to two one-hour classes. That went down to one hour, 120. I lost 300 and uh, I lost 11,520 rehearsal minutes per student. And when you fill in the number of students on a different dashboard, this lights up. So if you have 240 kids, it works out to be like 1.4 million minutes of rehearsal were lost. Now, when you're making a request to have summer rehearsals, when you're making a request to have extra private lessons, when you're making a request to have sectional coaches come in, 
this is where this type of data will inform that decision. This is where the, the ability to present a clear and concise damage report will inform what they're allowed to give you to make you whole again. So you can start left, right to left, opposite of reading, bottom right corner, COVID impact report. Everything that you need to fill out will be in green. And once you filled it out in green, it will be in white. Now, what I did next was I broke down, I believe what we should be looking at for heirs um, uh, recompensation and recapitulation, I broke it down into five areas and I started with equipment and supplies. So these are things that you would need as a part of your non music making experiences that would allow social distancing, that would allow um, for better maintenance and cleanliness. There are things like plexiglass shields, mouthpieces. So if you have a tuba player doubling on a mouthpiece, you replace it or you double it. If you only have so many vocals for a bassoon, you replace it, you double it. I also included things for color guard and then um, so PPE supplies and cleaning supplies. I tried to logically think through what I would need to be whole again and be able to provide a safe learning environment for every child. Now, is there something I might've missed? Perhaps. Is there something that uh, should have been included that wasn't? Perhaps. And you can add to the Google Doc. But I really tried to think about surfaces where multiple students touch, chairs, stands, racks, lockers, parts of instruments that multiple people would use. Bass trombones, I just thought of one, mutes. Mutes should be on there music stands, um, mouthpieces, even choral risers so that you can spread out further. That's what this is for. So the first thing I looked at was equipment and supplies. The next thing I did was I went and got cleaning estimates for every instrument so that you could send every single instrument out to be um, where appropriate electrosonically cleaned, where not appropriate, just officially cleaned. So all you have to do is say, I have 52 flutes, and it automatically populates it. So I need to spend $4,600 on flute cleaning. So what I think is important to recognize is that you can customize this and I'll show you a finished one in just a minute. You may be able to get your flutes clean for cheaper. That's fine. All you have to do is change that field. It will fix it. But what I did is I looked around at several music stores and several websites. And when, you, when I looked at purchasing things, I looked at standard uh, standard even best practices. And these are based on best practices. Now notice what's not on there, percussion. Because again, what is reasonable and fair. I'm not gonna call cleaning my timpani head with new timpani heads reasonable and fair. I can get a Clorox wipe and wipe a timpani down. So I really did try and be measured in this. Now, if you want to add timpani heads or that sort of thing you feel like needs to be cleaned, then you are free to add that. But I really tried to be tactical and practical about this in the way that I would approach it. So COVID impact report, stage one, what have we lost? Stage two, what are the equipment and supplies that we need to be socially distant and safe? Stage three, of all the equipment that we have, what will it cost to get it back to clean once we're post-vaccine and healthy? Stage four, computers, software, and method books. So this would be a place where, and this isn't about cleanliness, this is about equity, inclusion, and access while at home. If you ever wanted to do a Google Classroom, if you wanted a, a cow, as my wife calls it, uh, computers on wheels, third, uh, if you wanted a MIDI station, if you wanted, this would be where you'd apply for it. But I didn't just think about computers, I looked at tuners for every student so that they're not sharing tuners that every student would have access to a tuner. Then I looked at software because it talks very specifically about software. And this would be music ass assessment, whether it's music first, whether it's smart music, um, you know, whether it's uh, some platform akin to that. Student tracking software. I, I looked at that. That would be um, uh, a piece of software that you use for email communication, management of your students, management of your program, a charms, if you will. That would be applicable under um, this. And then drill writing software making sure that every kid has a drill book in their hands so that they're not looking off someone else's. That, these are things that are, that are applicable under the AIRS Act. And then last but not least, believe it or not, music method books. Now, most of you know, and this is not a sales job, 
most of you know that I wrote a music method book that's SEL. That would qualify under AIRS. Um, a leadership method book, a Dr. Tim book, a, a, an experience like that, that would qualify because social emotional learning and student mental health are a part of the ERRES Act. So those would qualify. So step one, what have we lost? Step two, what is the equipment and supplies we need? Step three, what needs to be cleaned? Step four, do we have the software that we need, access to technology that we need, and access to method books and information that we need? Then I went on to step five, which was, what are the instruments that need to be replaced? And it might be a bass trombone that's being doubled in concert band and jazz band. It might be you have one marimba and you've got three kids playing on it for percussion class. It might be you only have two berry saxes and you have four classes. It might be you need more stand up basses. It might be that you need more mallet equipment. The bottom line is, is that instrument purchase absolutely falls under equity, access, cleanliness, and prepared to learningness. It absolutely does. Now, many of you are smart, like Charles. I can see him right now working on his computer. It's good to see you, Charles. Um, I miss you. It's been, the COVID's been, it's been a while. Um, but when you look at this, um, please understand, you can find flutes that are $10,000. You can find flutes that are $15. The flute you would buy for an elementary beginner is not the flute that you would buy for a high school wind ensemble player. The prices I chose represented mid-grade instruments that you would feel comfortable in a top wind ensemble, um, but also in a, in a middle school uh, top band. I didn't price beginner instruments and I didn't price box strad, you know, pros. I tried to be very respectful. I tried to look at a cross, a cross section of instruments. In fact, because I'm not a flute expert and I went, well, they start at 50 bucks. The pros are at 10,000, but there seems to be a grouping right around 700 bucks that are high quality. So I'm putting in 679. But again, if you decide you want something different, you change that number. If when you submit your request, because you're, Charles, you're submitting for your top wind ensemble, you want that $1,400 flute, it's simple. Just change that number right there. And that will, number of instruments, it will get done. You choose the quality and the level of your instrument. But what I tried to give you was a base benchmark to go by. If you start beginners, these are probably a little high for you. If you're only buying for your top wind ensemble, these might not be high enough for you. So that's what I was shooting for. Again, start with your impact report. What have we lost? Then we go on to what supplies and equipment do we need? What will it cost to get our instruments back to whole? Do we have the software support and method books? What is the instruments that we need to make sure that we are socially distancing, we're not sharing, and everyone has access to an instrument? And then the last part, which was staffing. So returning children back to whole, remediating lost learning minutes, that can be done through instructional opportunities. You wanna have a summer lesson program? This is it. You wanna have summer sectionals? This is it. You wanna bring in an extra teacher next year part-time? This is how you do it. We actually built the staffing costs in for learning loss and remediation. So if I know that my kids lost 1.2 million minutes, the average kid lost 1,200 instructional minutes, then I wanna get some of that back. So I'm gonna do a private lesson for every kid for six weeks, that's 60 minutes. So that's 360 minutes I just got back. I'm gonna do a sectional every week for, for those kids. I'm gonna try and get back 10% of those minutes. Now, the way I broke it down was uh, the top is an employment contract, okay? I, I guesstimated on what an FTE is. If you live and work in Oklahoma, this is 7,000, right, Charles? If for a part, it's, they don't pay teachers very well in Oklahoma. If you work in Illinois, it's 15,000. So the point is, but I built the FTEs based on a $50,000 base salary. Okay, now I didn't include benefits and on, on instrument purchase, I didn't include tax and shipping. So you're just gonna have to help me out a little bit there. On um, private lesson programs. So if I have 140 students and I want them to get six weeks of private lessons at $20 an hour, that's gonna be $16,800. To get my kids closer to whole, I'm going to need $16,800. Now, you can pay your person less or pay them more, run it more than six weeks, but 140 kids, that's the private lesson bill. Then I did sectionals. 
So if, if maybe only 50 kids are going to do private lessons, but you want to do, you have eight sections and you want to do eight weeks of sectionals and you're going to pay that sectional coach $30 an hour, additional $1,920. So I could make, now think about this. This is, this is the music teacher in me. I could get every kid six private lessons or eight private lessons and eight group sectionals. And I could check every armature, every bow angle, every, you could really remediate. I mean, serious, you could do serious instructional remediation in eight weeks for $20,000. And $20,000 would be unthinkable in eight weeks in another time. But with the danger comes the opportunity. So we built that. I also built in time for you and colleagues to get together for in-service training. If you needed to bring someone in, you could do that, whatever their price per hour is, and wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Student leadership. If, you know, Charles, I, I just pick on Charles because it's right on my screen. You, you go to the Broken Arrow Dr. Tim session every year. Well, this is how you pay for it. That's social emotional engagement. That's making children whole. Thank you. This is how you do it. And I don't say that because I do student leadership. Get them to a Dr. Tim. There's nobody better than that gentleman. There's nobody better. The point is, you, that is part of the social emotional component of this process. So again, really quick, COVID impact report, equipment and supplies, instrument cleaning, <laughs> method books, instrument purchases, remediation and staffing. And then we wrote the emails for you to submit it all. All you have to do is print out the Google Sheets and send the emails or attach the Google Docs. We wrote the first email asking to be involved, the second email reminding them that you want to be involved, and the third email, although it says second there, we'll fix that typo. Andrew, if we could grab that typo in real time before we hand it out. Um, we wrote it all for you. We built the docs. We wrote the formulas. We, we thought through the process. We wrote the emails, and it all populates to this. This is your ESSER request dashboard. Everything that we've done, everything that we've done shows up right here. We built it so that you would all have it in real time so that you could understand the scope of what you were asking for in the moment you were asking for it. So having said that, I want to take you to a live actual sheet. These are numbers based on my last year of teaching. So when I taught, I had 240 kids my last year. It dropped to 198 the year after I left, 164 the year after that. We had an eight back-to-back 18% -back enrollment losses. Because of COVID, I typically spent about 42 hours training my leaders, either through uh, things that I did or workshops that they attended. We went to a camp in the woods for three days. I had 24 leadership students. We didn't do any leadership training. We had 984 lost leadership hours. In terms of rehearsal, we would have lost 2.1 million rehearsal minutes. 2.1 million rehearsal minutes and 21,000 parental involvement hours. Community service, the school lost 10,000 community service hours. My students collectively lost 40 performances between Friday night football games and pep assemblies and parades and all the things that basketball games, meaning collectively we lost 9,600 performances hours. We lost uh, $31,000 in 90% of our budget equity and no one got to do Allstate this year. So I started with that. Now, remember, I'm a high school band guy. So cleaning supplies, I felt like I had enough supplies where kids could share everything. But if I wanted kids to not share, I needed an additional 45 stands, 45 chairs, three chair racks, two cello racks, a bass rack, music folio cabinet, so they weren't all crowded around. I needed 12 additional brass mouthpieces. Most of them would have been tuba and bass trombone. That's where the sharing happened. Uh, woodwind mouthpieces, uh, one extra vocal, one extra berry sax, those sorts of things. I would have bought one of everything for my color guard. Um, and I would have um, bought uh, one student mask for every child, one bell cover, one woodwind bag, 20 things of cleaning supplies. I would have dry cleaned all my uniforms once. Um, cleaning spray, disinfectant wipes, disposable gloves. My request my request, Andrew, if you're in, actually, I can do this in real time. In real time on the master, we may want to expand that out. I'm not sure why that's closed in. My request. Scott, real quick, just expand column F. Just drag it out to the right a little bit. Yeah. Right, but this go. isn't the master. Yep, I'll update it. Thank you. So my request just for equipment and supplies would be for $19,823.29. 
Then I went over to instrument cleaning. Now, again, what's reasonable and practical. I didn't clean a single woodwind or flute or flute or clarinet. You know why? All the students own their own flutes and clarinets in my high school band. So I didn't need to. I cleaned the bass clarinets. Most of my oboes were so pieces of junk. The kids had their own oboes. I cleaned the bassoons. They all own their own saxophones. Um, tenor saxes, I owned a bunch for March Man Jazz Band, Barry Sax. But what my point is, what you'll see is, is that I was reasonable and prudent. I didn't say, I have 24 flute players, let's clean 24 instruments. No, it's the kid's flute, the kid can clean it. Now, if equity is an issue and he can't afford to clean it, I may budget four or clarinets. I may budget four. So I can tell little Timmy and little Sally, the cleaning's on me. That's part of equity and access and inclusiveness. So in addition to my $19,800, I need another $5,000 just to get my dirty equipment back to whole again. Next, I'm moving on to method books. I absolutely would buy a computer. I absolutely would try and get a classroom set of iPads. Um, if I thought there was use for it, I would absolutely buy a classroom tuner for every child. Absolutely. For 3000 bucks, I think it's the best money you can spend. Um, I would buy a license to smart music or music first or any one of those sorts of, of things. I would buy charms through this and I would make sure all my kids in March Man had their own drill book software so that they could be socially distant. And then last but not least, I would uh, buy 110 music method books and maybe 45 of, of a leadership manual, a leadership curricula. Uh, Dr. Tim has some just wonderful stuff and I have some stuff out there as well. So you can see where this got expensive, but it got expensive because of the computers if and the tuners. Um, you know, if we took away the iPads, if I thought I really don't have a use, I don't have a theory class, you know, this becomes a much more reasonable, much more reasonable uh, $13,000 gets every kid access to software and a tuner and learning opportunities like method books. Here's the biggie, instruments. So again, everything lights up green until you put a number in it. I didn't buy flutes. I didn't buy clarinets. I just think maybe a microscope's more important. I, I just think that. I think most kids can afford $19. And, and maybe if they can't, maybe I buy two of each just so that I would have access and equity, or access and opportunity for kids. So that's what I would do, to be honest with you. The point is I tried to focus on what are the things that kids are sharing, tubas, bass trombones, upright basses, upright cellos, mallet instruments, mallets themselves. If I had to be honest, and I taught in a Title I school, every tuba player had their own mouthpiece, but they didn't have their own tuba. They just didn't. We didn't have that kind of equipment. 240 piece band. I had three, four tuba players in every band. I didn't have 14 concert tubas. I didn't have 16 marimbas. I, I just didn't. So I focused my money, if this were me, on my big ticket items that were required to keep kids socially distant and not share equipment. That's low brass, that's low reeds, that's low strings, and that's percussion. And my request would have been for $84,742. And then last but not least, remediation and staffing. I absolutely would have uh, started a private lesson program and a sectional program. I absolutely, that, this would, we're gonna talk about priorities in a minute. This probably might've been my number one or number two priority is I did a, a remediation program. I did a lesson program. I didn't ask for any additional staffing. Um, and I, did, I asked for 500 bucks so I could get my staff together and train them. And then uh, student leadership, um, I would take them all to a Scott Lang event and Scott's giving a discount of one cent for every child that attends. So for a dollar, you can take kids to a Scott Lang leadership workshop. So that's what this is for. Again, the emails are there, but then this is where this, I think it really gets helpful. You print all this out, you take the email, you put it as an attachment and there's my dashboard. We spent, uh, my request would be for $124,234.73. Would I get it all? No, probably not. And we're going to talk about in the last 10 minutes, how to prioritize and those sorts of things, what you get and what you request. But the bottom line is I've now done my impact report. I know what, what got damaged and I did a systemic approach to how to fix it. And every one of those pillars are aligned with the verticals of the ESSER Act. 
every one of them. There were other things I would love to buy. I would love to buy sheet music. I couldn't find a, a justifiable, rational way to do it. You know, I, I, I would love to buy new, uh, new speakers for my front ensemble, but I really couldn't justify that in my head. I didn't think that was fair. I didn't think it was right. It wasn't something I would take to my administrator. So I didn't want to put it on there for you thinking you could take it to your administrator. We want to be professional. But also remember, nobody was impacted more than music. So nobody should be more deserving than music. Nobody lost more than kids in the activities and kids in the athletics. But athletics went on, but marching band didn't. So I believe I believe music should be number one in line for ESSER funds. Num not two, not three, not top five, number one. And now you've got not only the, the information and the data, but the system to prove that's a fact and fight for your kids. So Andrew, I normally would pause for questions here. I've got just two more slides to share and then I'll open up for questions. Sound good with you, Andrew? Sounds good, Scott. All right, so I'm gonna go back to the slide deck real quick. So now you've got this master document and I gotta tell you, I, I, if you haven't noticed in the last three to four months, Andrew and I have been just pushing to the wall to get content out. And I feel that this is the most useful thing among the most useful things we've ever done in the 10 years we've had to be part of the music. This could have real impact tomorrow for you. And so we hope that you appreciate uh, all that, that this brings to bear and that this brings to offer. So what do you do now? First thing you're gonna do, build out the database I just showed you. It literally, if nothing else, it's an exercise in long-term budgeting and planning. But I really believe that it's gonna give you the tools you need to fight for your program. So build it out. My estimated time, I forgot to build a demo one. At 3.20, I built it out. I was done by 3, 3.28, maybe. You know the information in your head. We're asking you all the right questions. Where there's a green, answer a question. Where there's not, don't. Build out your database. That's the first thing you're gonna do. Second thing you're gonna do is, is really sit down and prioritize your needs. Is it a lesson program or a new marimba? If it comes down to it, do you want a leadership experience or do you want a sectional experience? If it comes down to it, do you want PPE or do you want music stands? So you are gonna to have to make that decision based on the situation you're in and the students you serve, but you wanna build that database, you're gonna to wanna to prioritize your needs. Then what I would do is I would go through and I'd itemize and align it to the pillar and qualifier. This is an equity issue. This is a return to school issue. This is a learning loss issue. And had I had maybe just another day or two, I could have probably built out the Google Doc. I could have put numbers next to it, but it's not a hard thing to do. But when you submit, it just will help you do that and help you focus on what are the areas I'm addressing. And you may face and go, oh, I have nothing for learning loss. I need to do something. Or I haven't really addressed equity. What can I be doing to address equity in my music program? Give more kids access. And then submit your docs with your impact report, the cover letter we wrote for you, submit it to your district and your, and your administration. It's just that simple. It's literally just that simple. You have the opportunity and now you have the resources. And as I stated, what makes this so groundbreaking is not the size and the scope, but the decisions being made by someone you know. This isn't an anonymous grant program. This isn't three blind mice. This isn't some office in Washington, DC. This is someone within five miles of your building that's gonna make this decision. Who knows the work you do? Who knows the power of your program? Who knows how you've been impacted? And they're gonna to wanna to help. And this is how they're going to help. But you have to ask. You're ready to do it. I'm going to put three words out there. Create. Go in and create that document. Collaborate. Do it as a department. Do it across multiple schools that are their same level. Do it as a district. If you say, we need new tubas, and the school down the street goes, we don't. The district's going to be like, why do you need them? And they don't. We need new mouthpieces. We don't that if you collaborate, you'll, you'll be more impactful and you'll move the needle forward. And it's just the right thing to do. Collaborate within your band, choir, orchestra team, collaborate within your fine arts department, collaborate with other departments, collaborate vertically with your feeder programs, and then communicate. Always be emailing, always be, hey, how are we coming along? Is there anything else you need? Is there anything else I can do? Is there anything else I've missed? How can, when's that decision being made? What, is there something else that, that you would like me to do? Can I come present? just constantly communicating. Create the document, collaborate with your colleagues,
communicate with the decision makers. And remember, nobody, nobody has had the beat down you and your kids are have. So it's time to get off the mat and it's time to dust off and it's time to go take the fight to them. You've earned that right. Today is the day. I started this webinar saying that. Today is the day the sun comes up. Today is the day we see the light at the end of the tunnel. Today is the day we get a shot in the arm. Today is the day we bring our programs back to what they were and grow them from there. Today's the day to start. So let's start. This is where you get your Google Doc. bpotm.org forward slash Esser. That's bepartofthemusic.org, not the full words. bpotm.org forward slash Esser. Everything we've built is comprehensive. It's customizable to you and your needs. And it's convenient because you're already doing enough. So let us do some for you. Let us do what we do best so you can do what you do best. Teach. Today's the day to teach. So I'm putting on my tie and I'm going to work. With that being said, I want to thank you for attending tonight. I want to thank Andrew for all the work that he puts in that he, you don't get to see his face. And, uh, but he, he is the brains behind be part of the music. And I'm going to, at that moment, uh, turn the room open to questions um, that Andrew, maybe you can fill through the chat box or if someone wants to turn their mic on, um, now would be the time to do that. So what are some questions that you're seeing, Andrew? Yeah, so I tried to go through as you were talking and copy and paste them into a separate doc. So hopefully this will be pretty quick. Um, and I will just start through the list. Um, right. The first one, to be clear, we're asking our district to use the money they've already received for our program, right? That's what someone asked. So I, some of the districts haven't received their monies. The monies are starting to flow. They, they came uncorked uh, two and a half weeks ago. Where your district in, in terms of the money in the bank, I can't answer that. But if it's not there, it's arriving very soon. And by the way, I've read varying reports on this. It must be allocated by August of this upcoming summer and spent by May of 2022 is my memory correctly. But then I saw something about construction going to 2023 for ventilation systems, but it is imminent. And first to ask is first to be served. So get your ask in. That's great, Scott. Um, another person wrote, I wonder if this is applicable for elementary music, general music. It sounds great for middle or high school music band orchestra but I'm thinking about how it might affect K through five. Do your kids sit in chairs? Do your kids look at music stands? Do your kids play on ORF instruments? Do you have enough ORF instruments for every child? Then it is absolutely applicable to you. Do you have everything that you need to be socially distant and every child to participate in music making without sharing? It, I, I will grant you, your request will be much smaller, but the request is no less valid because it's smaller. That's great, Scott, thank you. Uh, the next question is, is my district allotted the same amount of funding regardless of whether or not I make a request? Yes. Your district is getting funding based on a Title I formula. It's a student formula and a Title I formula. Whether you ask for the money, you know, the thing I sent, we sent the email today is, there are three facts we know to be true. Your district's getting a lot of money. Fact two, you may not be one of the person who gets it. Fact three, we can help you get it. Your district's getting the check whether you request it or not. In fact, it is likely, like he said, he's already using his CARES money to buy mouthpiece kits. Your district's already gotten the money. The question is, have you? And I wanna share this with you really quick. When I, I loved my superintendent, when I left, I, I was really, I fought with him one year hard. It was equity, they opened a new school. It was Shining Hill, everything was brand new. And I was a Title I school that was 40 years old and we had a massive band program, they were starting a new one. And I went to battle for equipment with him. And he looked at me, laughed one day and he said, is this the battle you want to go down on? And I said, yes. He said, I'm going to teach you a trick. I said, okay. He said, there's always enough money in the budget. The question is, are you high enough on the pillar to see it? Your job is not to ask for money. Your job is to get higher on the pillar. And it was a new way of thinking for me. So my point is your district has the money in the bank account. You've got to go get up on the pillar to get it. You do that with information and data. Awesome, Scott. Uh, Ashley asked, I'm here for my whole fine arts department. Uh, she's a band director, but what about choir? 
specifically, I think people were asking about the ESSER worksheet. So uh, we have some things. I put music, music folios in there. I put um, I put uh, um, uh, risers in there, extra risers. I put um, um, dividers in there. All the PPE equipment would. I tried to think through as a choir person, which I'm not. I tried to think through what the needs are, and space was number one. PPE equipment was number two. Um, folios was number three. Those were things I logically, if I miss something, please feel free to add it, but there is choir on those documents. Awesome, Scott. Uh, Tara wrote, would equity include purchasing timpani and or xylophones because we started a percussion ensemble due to COVID and they're limited significantly in music because they don't have those instruments. Um, I absolutely believe uh, I put, I, if you saw my, my demo request, I requested one of every mallet instrument, a marimba, a xylophone, a bells, and a vibraphone. And frankly, I had a big enough percussion program, I would have requested two. So absolutely. Would I request another set of timpani? I didn't. Let me tell you why. Because I can just wipe the timpani down. I, I just, in my heart of heart, I couldn't look at my administrator and say, because of COVID, I need a second set of timpani. So I chose not to put timpani on that document because I, I couldn't justify it as a health and safety issue. Wonderful, Scott. Um, Rudy is asking, who would we send our requests to or does it differ by district? It's different by district. It, it might even be, be school-based. We don't know because every district's different. Your, one superintendent might say, we're controlling everything. Another super, superintendent said, we divide the amount by the number of schools and that's what you get. You know, some of it will go to health and safety remediation, new ventilation systems. If not, if your district gets $27 million, they're not going to divide, they're not going to send $27 million down to the schools. They're going to have to do some busing. They're going to have to do some ventilation. They're going to have to do some restroom renovations. They're going to have to do some of that. But it says a minimum of 20% has to go into the classroom. But I think more, and more than likely, it will be much more significant than 20%. Someone else wrote uh, that they're super shocked that districts aren't telling us this information. Uh, I think honestly, districts don't know. You know, it's so funny. I, I was, it seemed like if I wanted information on the coronavirus, I need to go to the CDC. My district came out three weeks later with information I learned on the, you know, I think they're drinking from a fire hose right now. And there's not like an office of grant recipient money of ESSER. It, it's not like this is a pre existing office. Uh, that we're used to getting information from. So I think um, some districts, the larger districts are probably more equipped than the smaller districts to handle this. But I would start asking as many questions as I could starting tomorrow. Awesome, Scott. Um, a couple people have asked about um, sharing this with colleagues and I just wanted to chime in. This webinar, the recording will be shared tomorrow afternoon along with Scott's slide deck. We'll also gather a few other uh, resources that popped up uh, during the webinar. We'll also include those in the follow-up email that we send tomorrow. We'll include those on the recording page as well. So once you get that, feel free to share it with every music educator that you know so that they can take advantage of this. Please do. Please, 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 please do. Let's, let's all help each other. And that's something we're really good at. What else? Any other questions, Andrew? Yeah, there's about 10 more here. <laughs> Lots of questions this time. We'll do a speed uh, round. Kevin wrote, what's that? We'll do a speed round. Awesome. Kevin wrote, can this be, um, can this be used for reimbursements or only for new purchases? You know, I think it's a moving forward. I think what it's moving be? forward. Next question. Uh, Cindy wrote, is there a deadline? I think you, you touched on this, but can you reiterate it again? The way I've read it and it's de the deadlines a little bit moving based on what you're asking for. It's an August request a year later spend. Now I think that the other one I saw one said like August, 2023, but I think that's for construction projects. So August requests, in other words, they have to allocate the money by this August. They have to make a decision on how they're going to use it and put it in motion by this August. Awesome. Warren wrote, I'm needing to replace a grade level's worth of recorders and other classroom instruments. Can I assume these shortfalls are worthy of being addressed through ESSER funding? I would say yes. And I would say it's an equity issue that some of them don't work and some kids aren't able to play every day because of that. And I would also say I need more equipment to buy more. And I would be just fine looking my administrator in the eye. And it's such a small ask. Recorders are so inexpensive. I absolutely would ask. And elementary teachers, you don't ask enough for things. So go ahead and ask. 
Melody wrote, could you request additional copies of choral music so that they don't have to share? Yes, 100%. That would be, and I should have thought of that. That was a, that's why I'm not a choir teacher. When I requested method books, that's where I would request extra choral music, 100%. Good call, whoever had thought of that, Melody. What a great name. <laughs> Roseanne wrote, in a larger, and I actually think Roseanne popped off, but this is still applicable. In a larger district, should we approach our uh, fine arts directors for equitable distribution, or is it something that we just go alone with our list? No, I, would, I wouldn't say for equitable distribution, but I would go through your fine arts coordinator with your request. Doesn't mean it's equitable. Like I said, in my district, we had a brand new school that had everything times five, and I was sharing a bass trombone with six kids. So it wouldn't be equitable, but I would absolutely go through my fine arts coordinator. Always work within the framework your, your building principal, your, your system, your fine arts uh, chair, your building assistant principal, your building principal, your fine arts coordinator, always go within the chain of command. Uh, SHHS Band Cupcake wrote, can you elaborate? I'm using this for staffing. They're facing a position cut at their middle school because of a full-time employee shortage. Can they really use this for yes. full-time employees? The answer is 100% yes. Whether you'll get it, I can't answer that. But I believe, I believe that will be likely be one of the number one uses of this is retaining staff to have smaller classes for remediation. It's gonna be a way to save jobs. That's my personal opinion. It's, I have no data to base that on, by the way. Uh, Mr. Maurizio wrote, is it a conflict of interest if we were to provide the summer sectionals and pay ourselves for the time? I would ask your HR personnel that. Uh, my guess is um, most districts frown on that. It's called double dipping. Um, and I think the appearance of it would be, uh, would be problematic, especially when you're asking for federal funds. Uh, I would go through my HR department on that. When I taught, we were not allowed to pay ourselves to write drill or arrange music or do anything. That was considered part of our professional responsibilities. Great response, Scott. Timothy wrote uh, that he's at three schools. Can he utilize ESSER for all three? Absolutely. And I would imagine they'd be three separate requests that go through three separate principles. A uh, few people have asked about using the ESSER funding to repair existing instruments to get enough working for non-sharing. 100%, yes, 100%. Okay, uh, someone's asking, uh, if we could share the link again, it is bpotm.org slash ESSER, and ESSER is E-S-S-E-R. Once you go to that page, you'll just be asked to submit your name and email address. Super simple. You've probably done that a hundred times with us. And then the very next page prompts you to click a button to copy the Google Sheet to your own drive. There is, hey, Andrew, uh, Sean just let us know there is a typo in one cell. So if you've downloaded it, if you haven't filled it out, wait just 30 seconds or wait 10 minutes and we will fix that typo really quick. And I'm texting it to you now. Okay, great, we'll get that fixed. And then while he's doing that, I, I'll cover for him. Someone in here just, um, th boy, there's some great, great comments in here. Here it is. Shelby Smith did a great job of iterating on choir uses for this. So if you're a choir teacher, look at what Shelby's comments are. She did a really nice job there. And I probably should have called Shelby if I knew Shelby um, prior to, uh, to doing that. Um, so uh, thank you, Shelby, for doing that. Um, so the fact sheet has been posted in the chat box. When you stated that the money is needs moving forward not to be reimbursed, what about reimbursement for PPE, bell covers that have already been purchased? I do not believe now, don't take my word on this. I do not believe you can submit for reimbursement. This is only for purchases moving forward. Um, so you should double check that, but I've never known anything in the federal government that allowed for a reimbursement. Uh, everything is purchasing moving forward. And thank you, Steve, for catching that typo. We're not perfect. We try. We're not perfect. Hey, Scott, which uh, specific, I'm sorry to interrupt you, which specific sheet is it on? So I can update this in real time. I see. You told me to which it's, one the it it's the remediation cell, or uh, uh, sheet. The remediation and staffing. Oh, that would be the staffing sheet, Andrew. 
Got it. I'm on it. Thank you. Thank you. So if you if you have that link, wait 10 minutes to re-download it. And frankly, um, if you're we we really did try and play with everything to make sure everything worked. But you can also wait till tomorrow and, and download the link as well. Um, if we didn't lose much time this year, can we use the information from what we lost at the end of last year? I think you can justify and rationalize with anything that you want. I don't think there's any parameters on, on how you gather your data. I would just be clear about that. You know, that, hey, this represents this time frame. So no one, uh, no one says that you can, um, uh, that you, you are not being forthright with your data. So where do we access the data for allotments for given LEAs in schools? It's on the US Department of Education website. So if you go to the US, just Google, where is the ESSER funds going? And it will pull up uh, a site and you can search by state and then by district. And, and that's as far as down as you can go. So uh, you can, any state, any district and, um, uh, and, and whatnot. So the money, someone said, uh, Beth, uh, Beth Scheimer from Brighton Music Center said, the money can also be used to offer a summer music camp that you normally charge a fee for. Absolutely. Folks, the summer learning is a no brainer, whether it's a, a, a summer camp, whether it's sectionals, whether it's private lessons, it's a no brainer. It meets like three of the seven criteria. It's a no brainer. So you absolutely should put that in there. The better plan for next school year, if these are requests being done in August to spend a year later, can we not plan these funds being used immediately? No, no, no. The requests, the deadline is August. They can decide tomorrow. They, they, tomorrow morning, they can issue a fund request to you. So if you wait till August, the money's going to be gone. And once you have access to it, you can use it immediately. The money is likely already in your district's account as we speak. Their bank account got a lot fatter in the last two weeks. Trust me. Um, I'm scrolling through. Um, would it make sense to ask for a sonic cleaner for instruments? Huh, Kathy, that's a really good point. It, I think it would. I think it would. What was, I'd have to go back to my, my instrument cleaning request. I'm gonna go to it right now. Um, uh, instrument clean, my instrument cleaning request was for $6,000. Yeah, I think you could. I think you could make that argument. I, I think you could make that real hard. And, and just say, I'm going to clean them every two weeks. And then you go, instead of cleaning once a year at 5,000, I'm going to clean them once a month and it's 50,000. Now that, that sonic cleaner looks really, really cheap. That's a really good one. So many great comments. This sounds like a dumb question, but it's, but is a start asking, this sounds like a dumb question, but is a start asking admin about ESSER funds? I'm not sure what that means. Andrew, are there any other questions that we missed? I don't think so. I think we got through all the ones that I had copied and you've kind of looked at the most recent ones. I did correct that cell. There may be another typo or, you know, equation thing like that. If that pops up, you can, you can email us anytime. We'll get it corrected right away. And it's pretty intuitive. You, if you catch a typo, you can probably fix the formula. It's it, everything's pretty. Look at the cell above it and just copy that formula pretty much and it, it will work. Um, so many great questions. Humidifiers for the orchestra room. What a great one. Uh, gap outlets, uh, spacing, lockers. Um, is this for public schools only? No, it is for charter schools. And there are funds for private schools, but that goes through the governor's office. And each governor can determine how to spend that money as he or she sees fit. So those are all the questions that I'm seeing, Andrew. Um, is there anything else you feel like we've missed that we want to share with these, these good folks who decide to spend their Thursday night with us? Nothing else comes to mind. Um, I did put the email address that you can reach both uh, me and Scott at, which is info at bepartofthemusic.org. Uh, so if you message that email address, Scott and I will both get it. And we race to see who can respond uh, first. So feel free to reach out to us there. And then Scott, I know you always share your personal contact details. I don't think you've done that yet. Yeah, no, if you want to reach out to me, uh, first of all, um, someone asked about expanding your room. This would qualify. I just don't know that you can get it done by August. That was why I didn't include room alterations. Um, I'm available at scott at scottlang.net. I'm putting that in. 
um, to everyone. Or you can go to info at bepartofthemusic.org. Um, and then my phone number is 480-577-5264 if you need to reach out to me. Uh, we're here to help provide real solutions in real time to real problems. Uh, we hope that we've done that tonight. This concludes our um, Understanding ESSER, a once in a generation opportunity. Uh, we thank you for everything that you do. And don't forget, don't forget, today's your day. Nobody endured more, so nobody's more deserving than you. Go get them. Go get them. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Good luck. God bless. And uh, enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you so much. You are great welcome. information. I needed it. So glad to help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes sir. <laughs> don't, don't forget, music is the key to the soul. Thank you so much.